to the Coders Campus Podcast, where you'll learn how to code from one of the best teachers in the industry. Whether you're an absolute beginner or a seasoned pro, the Coders Campus Podcast will teach you what you need to know to master the art of programming. And now, your host, Trevor Page. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to the Coders Campus Podcast. I will be your host, Trevor Page. This is a momentous uh, occasion for myself uh, and hopefully for you as well. Um, I had previously recorded a podcast called the How to Program with Java podcast. Uh, I think it was 65 episodes strong and uh, unfortunately it was removed from the iTunes library most likely because of the fact that I had the word Java in the title of that podcast which is a trademarked word. So lesson learned here we are now I'm starting up the Coders Campus podcast which you can see does not have any third party trademarks in the title so there we go uh, but more more exciting is that I'm picking up where we left off in terms of the how to program with Java podcast so if you were a previous listener of the how to program with Java podcast then this is exactly where you need to be now if you have not yet listened to that podcast I would probably recommend doing so uh, you can do so via my website if you go to coderscampus.com forward slash podcast, you'll be able to see sort of all the back episodes um, of the old show. Uh, so you can sort of get up to uh, snuff or up to, you know, speed of where it is that we're picking up now. So in the previous series, the How to Program with Java series, I taught you how to program with Java. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Uh, and in this uh, now podcast, the Coders Campus podcast, I will be, uh, you know, like I said, picking up where we left off. I'm going to be diving into some of the new technologies that have come out in the world of Java since we last spoke, uh, probably many years ago or maybe one year ago. I should really check and see how long it was that uh, that podcast came out. But anyway, um, or should I should say the last podcast episode came out. But uh, yeah, we're going to pick up where we left off with all the new technologies and specifically in this episode we're going to be diving into something called spring boot if you've never heard of spring boot before uh, you're in for a treat this is something that in my opinion uh, let me bring up my show notes here uh, in my opinion this is possibly one of the greatest things to happen to java at least in recent history um, it, it's been the introduction of the projects from the spring.io team now the spring tools have sort of been flip-flopping back and forth between different domain names and perhaps even different owners but now spring.io is is backed by, uh, I forget who specifically it was, but there was a very, very substantial investment in the Spring I.O. team and the tools and stuff that they're going to be bringing out. Um, so I have the utmost confidence that they are going to continue to deliver uh, amazingly useful tools to us Java coders. One such tool uh, is the Spring Boot project. So again, if you go to spring.io, let me bring it up on my own computer. This is sort of, you know, interactive uh podcasting, if you will. If you go to spring.io, uh, they have a section where you can see their projects. And uh, there's a whole bunch of prod projects. The, the, the Namely, the, the biggest one that they have is probably uh, the Spring Framework. I've already touched on the Spring Framework in past episodes of the How to Program with Java podcast, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to disqualify it as a potential topic for the Coders Campus podcast, which is what you are now listening to. Uh, so I surely will be talking about that, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but anyway, you, you look through, there's a whole bunch of different projects on here. I, on even know how many there are maybe 20 or so um, but one of the ones like I said we're gonna be talking about today is the spring boot application or project whatever you want to refer to it as and if I click on that project and sort of you know try to tell you what spring boot is in terms of their words uh, they say that spring boot takes an opinionated view of building production ready spring applications spring boot favors convention over configuration and is designed to get you up and running as quickly as possible so that's sort of a convoluted way of saying, look, we're going to make your life easier as a Java programmer, specifically when you're starting a new application. So let's let's paint the picture of what life was like before Spring Boot hit the market. Um, and by market, I mean the free market, the open source market. Developers love free stuff, I know. So uh, before Spring Boot you know, came to light... Uh, Creating a brand new web application, um, you know, starting up a new project would take hours of work, hours of configuration, hours of rebooting the server, hours of Googling uh, silly little errors that are happening, you know, uh, exceptions being thrown, um, hours of tearing your eyeballs out just to get to a point where you can launch an application that will say, you know, hello world or something like that. So Spring Boot 
fixes this pain specifically. So the best way to think about Spring Boot is the the smart ladies and gentlemen on the Spring team have handpicked the most commonly used libraries and put them together in such a manner that they work out of the box with sensible default settings pre-configured for us. So that means that you can get up and running, you can create a brand new web app with, you know, JPA and MySQL database integration, um, copy, you know, some properties over and then boom, you're ready to rock. So um, I t- I've timed myself before. I can create an entire web application with a controller that integrates with a database, a MySQL database, and performs create and read commands uh, to and from the database in five minutes. Up and running in five minutes, Okay integrated with a database, ready to rock, five minutes. And really the only code generation that happens is is more or less four lines of code um, in, in a, one little Java file that you'll never really ever look at um, again since the creation of that file. It's really sort of like the file that has your public uh, static void main class where you you know can run the, the project from. Uh, but you really, you never have to look at that class again. You could, you can go and, and tweak it if you like, but I've never had to in my experience with Spring Boot. Um, so this is kind of like in a contrast to something like Spring Roo, which I've taught before. For Spring Roo, um, the days of Spring Roo were, you know, lots of heavy code generation, and it would often, you know, create a whole bunch of uh, bloated code that you wouldn't really uh, know what the heck was going on with it and whatnot. Spring Boot is very, very different for that. Okay, I'm talking dead simple, straightforward code, five minutes, done. Okay, it's a bit of a game changer in my opinion. Uh, it, we can, since we can quickly create apps from scratch and potentially launch them via, you know, the cloud or something in like under an hour. Um, think about how much that would impress like a potential client. You could say, oh, you know, you can take their their idea, the idea that they they want you to, you know, build an app for them or something like that, and then you can say, okay, well, you know, let, I think I have an idea of what that could look like. Let me see if I can put together an example for you, and in like. Two hours, if you were really hustling, or maybe within the first day, the next day, let's say, um, you could send them a link to uh, an actual URL, and they could visit it and be like, holy cow, like, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. You know, very basic, maybe wireframed, no functionality built into it, but a basic uh, wireframe of the application live on the internet. All right? Um, Usually the first day, like I said, first day would be uh, set aside to, you know, do all of the stuff with configuring everything and so on and so forth, but that's not what you need to worry about anymore with Spring Boot. You don't need to go through the hassle of creating a web XML file, an application's uh, context uh, XML file, uh, configuring your transaction manager, bringing in your your you know the proper data source um, beans and uh, setting up your uh, all the different you know uh, I can't even remember all the stuff in the web XML file and finding what the right um, I can't even remember anymore. It's been so long since I've done that now. You don't have to worry about that. It's all done for you. It's done for you with sensible defaults. Like they say, they, they say it's from, and it takes an opinionated view of building production-ready spring applications. What that means by opinionated view is that, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, there are technologies that play together very nicely, very well. They, they play well together and they make for very stable production ready applications. So what Spring does is it takes those things and sort of gives them to you in a very easy to use and pre-configured manner using, like I said, sensible defaults um, so that you can just hit the ground running with your code and you don't have to worry about configuring the stupid stuff. Okay, like I said, Spring Boot favors convention over configuration. So there's there's... They do the the configuration for you. They take that burden out of your hands. Now, if you want to get in there, the nitty gritty, and configure yourself, then you can. You can go in there. You can override the defaults. You know, hopefully using Java config um, stuff. So you know, you'd use a, a create an actual Java class and do the configuration inside of a Java class instead of XML, because that's where the future is going um, away from XML files and just you know sticking with plain old Java code. Um, but you can do that if you want. You have that uh, that ability to do that if you want, and uh, and it's lovely. Okay, I cannot sing its praises enough. So okay, you get it. Spring Boot is awesome. So the question you may have is, how do you use it? Well, good question. You have essentially two options. Uh, one, the one I like to talk about, but perhaps this this is not very universal is using the Spring Tool Suite IDE. So, you know, if you go to spring.io, they have the Spring Tool Suite, the STS um, IDE that you can download, which is essentially just the Eclipse 
uh, IDE, which some people don't like, and that's fine. You know, hey, it's free. You know, you get what you pay for. Um, but really, it it's very, it's much more solid. It's much more reliable. It's much faster than you know pr- uh, previous iterations of Eclipse. Um, now, you know, they've taken that into heart. The these you know opinions that us programmers, us highly opinionated people, have about the um, you know the, the the how much it crashed and all this stuff. And it's a much more stable, much more friendly, much more um, dependable uh, IDE that you can use. And again, it's free, so you can't beat that. In any case, Spring Tool Suite is an extension of Eclipse with essentially a little bit of styling put in in terms of like the way it looks and feels. It has a bit more of a Spring uh, branding to it, I guess you can say. And uh, it has the Spring tool, uh, sp- Spring tools built into it automatically. So having said that, because this Spring Tool Suite uh, version of Eclipse has the Spring tools built into it, you can use Spring Boot right out of the box when it comes, you know, shipped within the Spring Tool Suite IDE. So that's the, that's the method that I would recommend that you do. In the Spring Tool Suite, you can click File New, and you can say Spring Starter Project. So when you click Spring Starter Project, you can essentially do everything uh, you need to do in terms of using Spring Boot to get up and running with a new Spring Boot app. Uh, also, coined the, the, the term that is coined for a Spring Boot app is a bootiful app. I felt that that was very punny. So there you go. If you ever heard uh, hear people referring to a bootiful app, you can you know it's built with Spring Boot. Um, cute people. Very cute. Anyway, uh, the second way that you can go about starting a Spring Boot app or a bootiful app is by using the Spring Initializer uh, website, which is start.spring.io. Again, start, like the start button on your Windows machine or on the car of yours if you have a fancy car that has a push button start start start.spring.io it's called the spring initializer and it's just a website that allows you to generate a zip file so just a plain old archive type of file Um, it's the same sort of thing you you type in your um, the the dependencies uh, sorry the dependency name the art the artifact id so that's stuff for maven if you're using uh, maven to build um, your project and then you type in whatever dependencies you want we'll talk about those in a second and then you click on generate project and boom it'll create your zip file and then you can import that zip file into whatever IDE you're using um, that's sort of a, a generic thing so I, I don't want to talk about all the different IDEs that you, you can use and how to import a zip file but trust me you can use this thing called Google and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do and get up and running with it all right cool so um like I said, using the Spring Tool Suite, it just saves you the small effort of having to import the zip file because when you use the Spring uh, Tool Suite and you say File New Spring Starter Project, you can, like I said, do all the same things that you can do on the start.spring.io website. Um, it's just as soon as you click Generate Project, it doesn't generate a zip file per se. It you know creates that zip file and then automatically de- automatically deploys it for you. So like I said, just saves you that little bit of effort of importing. So when uh like i said either way you 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 choose to do it you'll need to tell spring boot which dependencies you'd like to add to your project so by dependencies i mean that you need to tell spring boot if you'd like to you know include libraries to support um the the web application so um for example if you want to use a mysql database um or if you want to be using timely for a templating framework uh or you know those kinds of dependencies is what i'm talking about so let let me give you the example of my most commonly used libraries when i'm programming and creating my own web applications you might have different ones that's the beauty of this these dependencies you can search for choose which ones you like and then go ahead and include them and spring boot will you know do it work its magic and and do everything uh, it needs to do to get you up and running super fast okay so my most commonly used libraries are uh in no particular order web okay so you type in web and i i select it and um for that, that includes, you know, all the Spring Framework stuff. So, you know, Spring Framework, the MVC uh, stuff, and all the libraries that you need to get up and running with a web application. Uh, MySQL. Okay, so this really just brings in the ability to use the MySQL connector, and it gives you the ability to easily uh, in, create in a properties file um, how to connect to the database. So your your um, your connector connector string and your properties, you know, username, password, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you type that in MySQL, boom, or you you click it as a check checkbox, whichever version version one or two that I talked about in terms of using Spring Boot, whichever one you're using. Um, either you're typing it in a search for it or you're clicking it on a checkbox. So I use MySQL. 
But perhaps you want to use a, you know, PostgreSQL database or, you know, an Oracle um, or, you know, whatever. Whatever the case may be, you choose the one that you want to use and support. Great. I also choose JPA. Uh, JPA, which brings in Hibernate, because Hibernate is an implementation of JPA. JPA standing for Java Persistence Annotation. Um, so, you know, it brings in Hibernate, and it also brings in Spring Data, which we're going to talk about in future episodes. Uh, Spring Data saves you a crap load of time when it comes to uh, creating your CRUD stuff, CRUD being create, read, update, and delete. So doing your database functionality. Uh, anyway, I bring in JPA. I bring in Timeleaf. Uh, Timeleaf is uh, something that we're also going to be talking about in future episodes of the Coders Campus podcast. Um, Timeleaf allows you to create and use plain old HTML files as your views um, in the model view controller uh, paradigm. Um, uses you know plain old HTML files instead of JSPs. So it's you're, we're getting away from JSPs, Java server pages, um, and, and in favor of HTML because uh, the reason for that is. Um, when you are someone like a designer who works with, you know, designing uh, web pages, uh, it's annoying to work with JSPs because JSPs only run properly in the context of a web server enabled environment. So what that means is in order to properly, you know, load up and, and, and see and use a JSP file, you need to have, you know, probably an IDE up and running. You need to have all of your uh, files in there up and running. You need to have your web server running, which means you have you have everything configured properly. And it needs to be a, a properly functioning and compiling application that you need to run on a web server in order to uh, see and view the changes you make in a JSP file. Okay, that is fine for coders, but that is not fine for someone who is just a designer. Okay, designers don't want to have to use all that other stuff because that's not really their expertise. What they want to do is they just want to work in plain old HTML files, perhaps with Notepad or something like that. Not to you know speak the ill of the designers out there, because I myself think that that is a fantastic skill set that I absolutely do not possess. <laughs> I'm not a designer. Um, I'm a sheer coder. I'm a code monkey. Um, so yeah, designers just want to use plain old HTML. That's it. HTML, CSS, plain text, uh, you know, nothing fancy, no web servers, no nothing. Um, you know, you can run run your, your application, quote unquote application, by double clicking on the index.html file and opening it up in your browser and then clicking through everything. That's how a designer ideally wants to work, right? So that's what Timeleaf does. Timeleaf allows you to create plain old HTML files um, and, and and be able to bring in the, the inter, interactivity, inter to know it's the word I'm looking for, uh, the the communication between your presentation layer and your uh, business layer. So being able to talk with Java and still use stuff, um, you know, be able to, you know, grab stuff from the model and do all that, you know, song and dance and whatnot in an, in an HTML file. So anyway, Timeleaf, really cool. Um, I'm, I'm really favoring it now over creating JSPs. I had to go back. Um, I'm working on a, a project right now with um, a sort of a, a separate employer, which that's neither here nor there, but they're using JSPs. And every time I see them, I'm like, ugh, like it just seems dirty now. Uh, but that might just be me with a little silver spoon up my butt with Timeleaf. But hey, I like Timeleaf and we're going to talk about it. Really wasn't that hard to learn about. Maybe it was up and running within, you know, two days of playing around with it. So not a huge learning curve uh, if you have a good head on your shoulders. Okay, sorry. That was a long rant. To go back to what we were talking about was the most commonly used libraries with Spring Boot, because that's what we're talking about is Spring Boot right now. Um, I named four. So the web, uh, MySQL, JPA, Timeleaf, and Spring Security. Okay, Spring Security, great uh, platform. I've talked about it in the past. Hey, let's talk about it again in the future on this podcast. Uh, I look forward to doing that because uh, I love talking about programming stuff. So uh, in, in this particular you know, podcast episode, I'm really going to be focusing on the use of uh, the first four of those five dependencies. So the web, MySQL, JPA, and perhaps even Timeleaf. Um, I'll, I'll just give a, you know, a quick um, you know, nitty gritty, or not nitty gritty, a quick view on how you would use that in a typical Spring Boot application. So Essentially, that means in this podcast episode, I'm going to try to make it in such a way that uh, we can create a web application built with the Spring framework with MVC that's integrated with a MySQL database and uses JPA, specifically Hibernate with Spring Data, all brought together with Timeleaf for our views, like I said, HTML files instead of JSPs. So in other words, we're going to build a full stack web application with Java using Spring Boot. We're going to build a bootiful app. 
So how the heck are we going to do this via audio? If this is your first time listening to the Codus Campus podcast, I do my very best. I realize that this is a very visual thing, um, but sometimes, you know, taking advantage of the time that you're, you know, walking the dog or at the gym or driving to and from work or doing the dishes or cleaning the house or heck, even in the shower, if you have a good um, waterproof or water resistant speaker in the shower, um, this is all time that you can use to sort of get the ball rolling with uh, programming stuff. Okay, people seem to love this concept of, you know, listening to podcasts and sort of priming the pipe, so to speak, with with programming um, ideas and, and, you know, knowledge, and then, you know, hitting the, hitting the ground with it and, uh, and actually coding um, afterwards. So typically how I, I, I typically uh, set up these podcast episodes is I'll go through this stuff, I'll talk about it, you'll listen to it, you'll uh, absorb it as much as you can, and then I'll have a show notes page where you can go. So this one will be uh, coderscampus.com forward slash one, the number one, because that one is for episode number one. So coderscampus.com forward slash one, and you'll be able to see uh, everything that I talked about in sort of written format, and you'll be able to see the visuals, and you can use that and, uh, you know, like I said, hit the ground running and, and actually um, implement whatever it was that you learned, okay? So that's that's the, the, the exact same formula that we're going to have for every episode of the Coders Campus podcast in the future. I'm going to teach you something. You're going to listen to it. You're going to learn it as best you can. You're going to go to the show notes page at coderscampus.com slash whatever the episode number is, and then you can grab it and um, and actually implement whatever it was we were talking about. Cool? So, whew, having said that, let's actually get into the nitty gritty now. So the first step is to create your Spring Boot p- uh, project. I'm going to talk about doing the universal way because that way everyone is happy, um, which is very hard to do, making everyone happy. Uh, anyway, uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to head over to start.spring.io. Uh, you're going to give your project on this screen uh, an, a group name and an artifact name. Uh, so this is if you're generating a project with a ma- with Maven. That's what I choose to use, but you can also use, um, uh, what is it called? Let me go to the spring start.spring.io website. You can also generate with Gradle. Okay, uh, I believe when you d- use Gradle, you still need to give it a group name and an artifact name, just because that's how dependencies work in terms of creating your own dependency. But you give it a group name and an artifact name. Your group name is typically the um, the website in which the web application will be deployed. So uh, for me, I would you know deploy mine on on coderscampus.com. So therefore, my group name is com.coderscampus. So you just reverse the URL. Okay, and the artifact name is whatever you want your project to be called. Okay, I, I just used the the uh, the artifact that I created was my first bootiful app because I thought that that was cute. Uh, so you give your project a group and artifact name, and then you search and for and add your dependencies. So there's another box where you can type in the dependencies that you want to search for. Um, Or you can actually, you know, I think you can see all the options. You can click on a little link to see every single option, which can be a bit overwhelming in terms of the different dependencies that you can build into your project. Um, But if you don't, if you know right off the top of your head which ones you want to use, then you can type them in and search for them and click on them and sort of add them like uh, like tags almost. So I choose web, JPA, MySQL, and Timeleaf. Then you go ahead and you click on the generate project button. Okay, and then it creates a zip file. So you grab the zip file, you import it into your IDE of choice. Um, I won't go over that step. You can do that yourself. And then um, what I do is you're, you're pretty much almost ready to rock. You can, you can pretty much uh, at that point start up your, your project and it, will, it should run. Now, if you've integrated, told it to integrate with a database, it might give you an error saying it can't find the database or can't find the properties or something. So there are a sample set of properties that you should, probably should bring in. Uh, so you can go to, uh, there is an application.properties file that you'll find inside of the, um, the, the structure that it generates. There's a source main resources, I believe. Let me double check that and make sure I'm not lying to you. So there's a source main resources uh, section Okay, uh, where you can go in and you'll see there's a an application properties file that you can actually play around with. Well, I think when you actually open up the application.properties file, at least for me with this setup that I just talked about, it's going to be empty. There's not going to be any properties built into it uh, yet. And this is where, you know, I, I would recommend copy pasting some default properties. I won't really get into every single one of these properties right now, but the um, the ones that you really need to get up and running are to tell um, your, your Spring app how to connect to your database. 
Uh, so the first thing is like a spring.datasource.url. So all these are, are you know, spring.datasource.something. So the first one is a URL. So you tell it the connection string to connect to your MySQL database or whatever database uh, you have, you know, PostgreSQL database or uh, Oracle or, um, you know, MS, what's it called? MS Microsoft server database. You know, you type in the URL, whatever the connection string is. Uh, you give the class name, the driver class name for your uh, your database driver. Okay, same thing you would always have to do. You give also you give it a username and a password to connect to your database. Right, those are the database types thing uh, things that you need to do. Um, and, you know, there's some other, you know, options for JPA to tell, you know, JPA what you're using. Like you need to tell it a dialect um, so that you're using a MySQL dialect. Um, you know, you can tell it whether or not you want to see the SQL output in your console when you're in debug mode type of thing. Um, you can tell it, you know, how to how to behave when you start up the application in terms of do you want it to, you know, create and drop your databases every single time or just stick to updating it, that kind of thing. Um, and even time leaf, there's a property for that that I tend to set for caching. I like to turn the time leaf caching off uh, because in development mode, if you have caching turned on, I believe it's turned on by default. Um, it, it's a bit annoying because if, if you make a change to your HTML file, your view file, um, you would need to reboot your at web app or server every single time. And that's really annoying and time wasting. So uh, I turn off caching in, in development mode. Um, that way it doesn't cache the file. So as soon as I make a change, you can refresh the uh, view, the uh, browser, and you'll be able to see the changes immediately. So that's just a rundown of the properties. There's, you know, what is that? Eight, nine properties. Uh, not a whole lot. And and on the, uh, like I said, the show notes page, coderscampus.com slash one, you'll be able to see uh, exactly what I'm talking about. You can copy paste those properties in for yourself and you'll be ready to rock. So once um, the properties are in there, uh, then you, you more or less should be able to start up your application, your, your Spring Boot application. Um, so to start it up, how do you do it? Well, what I do is I right click on the project and I hover over, this is in my Spring Tool Suite. You right click on the project, you hover over Run As, and then you can click on um, Spring Boot application. Okay, so you're running it as a Spring Boot app. And what that does is it launches the the, the sort of the Spring Boot uh was an integrated web server. It's just a Tomcat server, but it, it's integrated right in there. And uh, and then you're ready to rock. It, it boots up your server and uh, and your Spring Boot app should be um, up and running and ready to go. Okay, no configuration other than just that one properties file because um, you have to have that. I mean, you have to tell it what the name of the database is and you know what kind of database you're using. But uh, once that's there, once that's in, you're good to go. You can now go and start coding uh, from that point. You can create your, um, your what should we call it, uh, MVC stuff, so your controllers. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. You can create your controllers. Uh, you can, you know, map your controllers, um, the, the URLs and the controllers. You can have it return a view. Um, what I recommend is when you're using Timeleaf, for your project, uh, the, the, the view files, the HTML files that you create, you should put them in the templates directory. So there's a, under the source main resources folder, so the same place where your application properties file is, where I just told, talked about in terms of putting in the properties for connecting to database and whatnot, in that same folder, there's a templates directory. Um, in templates is where you put your views, your HTML files. So just put them in there. Uh, that is where you will be, you know, referring from your controllers to your views, that's where they're going to be pointing to. Okay, by default, it'll point to the templates directory. So you put your HTML files in there, and then you can hook up your controllers to um, to that right away. You're, you're good to rock, you're good to go. So, you know, if you want to create an index.html file, you put it in the templates folder, and then if you run the app and you have a controller that points to, you know, uh, index as the view, uh, then there you go. It'll it'll grab it and it'll spit out that page and, and you're good to go. Um, also good to know, uh, you know, tips and tricks here is when you're creating your JavaScript and CSS files, there's a static directory, a static folder inside of the same place, source main resources. Um, in your source main resources uh, directory, you can put, um, or sorry, source main resources static directory. In the static directory, you can put your JavaScript and CSS files. Okay, that's where it's going to look um, in that folder when you reference, a, like if you want to import a JavaScript, an external JavaScript file um, into your, you know, into your HTML file. Um, that's where it's going to look for by default. So if you put, you know, JS slash, you know, my JavaScript file dot JS, it's going to look in the static folder. 
that's where it's going to look by default. So there you go. And also, again, you don't need to create an application context XML. You don't need to create a web XML. They're going to be automatically created behind the scenes with sensible defaults within Spring Boot. And like I said, if you want to, you can always go and, and create your own Java config files and override those defaults. Um, but it is so fast to be, like I said, I've done this in five minutes. Okay, I just took 30 minutes explaining every single step of creating a Spring Boot app. Okay, uh, painstakingly for 30 minutes, more or less, I've been trying to explain probably less than 30 minutes. I've been trying to explain how to uh, create a, a, um, a web application created in Java with Spring Boot. Uh, it took me less than 30 minutes to talk to it through and explain it to you. It'd be much faster to show it to you, um, but to talk and explain it to you, it took me about 30 minutes to do so. And if I were to not use Spring Boot, and if I were to use just my pure intellect as an expert Java programmer and go and code as fast as I possibly could, I still wouldn't be able to create a web application in under 30 minutes using um, you know, my expert knowledge of, of Java and creating all this configuration stuff like that. It would still take me more than 30 minutes. So even just explaining it to you over a podcast is still faster than doing it the old way. So Spring Boot absolutely fantastic and i mean it just just having what i talked talked about now is just the beginning of what you can do with spring boot um you know bringing in uh new um libraries new dependencies is so simple like if you want to now bring in um spring security okay that's something that we're going to probably talk about in another episode in the future um bringing in spring security normally you'd have to know all the different you know maven palm uh, you know, types of things that you need to bring in and which version works with your, um, you know, w which version you have in terms of the, you know, the spring uh, framework version that you're using and the hibernate version and all this stuff, you know, you need to pick, you need to know the right um, spring security version to bring in, right? Because I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend using, you know, spring framework version three and then trying to bring in spring security version four or something. They might not be compatible. So, the beauty, also the beauty of Spring Boot is you don't have to know the version, okay? You pick just one version. You pick one version of Spring Boot, which right now, as of the publishing of this podcast, we are at Spring Boot version uh, 1.3.5 is in sort of general general release right now, um, with 1.4.0 being in um, sort of one of their snapshot releases. So 1.3.5 is a Spring Boot version. You pick that one version number, 1.3.5. Okay, which is I should have mentioned also as default, it's, it, you, the latest release version is is picked. The ra latest general release version is already by default picked. Uh, whether you're starting a new Spring Starter project in the Spring um, tool suite, or if you do it via start.spring.io, the the default, the the you know latest and greatest general release version is automatically picked, so you don't even have to think about it. But anyway, because we're on 1.3.5 in Spring Boot it will automatically know which version of Spring Framework to use, what version of Hibernate to use, um, which version of Spring Security to use when you bring it in in, a, in your palm file, um, and so on and so forth. Which version of Time Leaf, which version of everything. This is an opinionated view of setting up your web application files. Okay? By opinionated, they mean they're going to pick the versions for you, so you don't have to worry about it. So cool. I, I mean, I absolutely love how much thought they put into this whole thing to make it so easy on us, the developers. So just, you know, we don't, we're not developers because we want to configure stuff, okay? We don't want to do DevOps stuff. We want to do just the dev part. We want to do the development. We want to be free to code and, and be happy and do all the things that we do as coders that make us, uh, you know, salivate at the mouth, um, which is, you know, creating great applications that can be scaled up and run in production environments with millions of users, Okay, that's that's how we get our rocks off, if you will. So that is what Spring Boot is designed to do, get us up and running as quickly as possible and focusing on what matters, which is the coding, not the configuring. Cool? So there you go. Spring Boot uh, in the bag. That is, there, like I said, there's more uh, you know, that you need to, not need to, but more, more you can experiment with with Spring Boot. You'll learn all about it as, as you go and start to use this stuff. You'll get more comfortable with it. Um, it's just... It's lovely. It's a lovely platform. It's a lovely project. 
and it saves us so much time. So hopefully you enjoyed this first inaugural episode of the Coders Campus podcast. Um, thank you so much for listening, for joining up. Uh, like I said, I would recommend going to coderscampus.com forward slash one to see the show notes for this episode to you know help help make it more um, make it make more sense. Also, um, you can go to coderscampus.com slash podcast to see previous episodes of my old podcast that sort of got discontinued. Um, but really, like I said, this is really episode number 66 or whatever it is of the How to Program with Java podcast. I just can't call it the How to Program with Java podcast due to trademark infringement. So this is the Coder Startup podcast, episode number one. Thank you for listening. Now, because I'm relaunching this podcast and because you have been such an avid listener, listening all the way to the end of this episode, if you will, um, I would ask you to do me one uh, favor. I would really love for you to go and give this uh, show a rating and a review. If you haven't um, you know, made up your mind yet as to whether or not you like this podcast, that's fine. That's cool. I can wait. I'm willing to you know, put in the work and the effort to convert you over onto the good side um, but if you've made up your opinion and, and you feel like this is a good podcast that's going to be helpful to you, um, or even if you were a past listener of the How to Program a Java podcast and you want to do me a solid, uh, please leave a rating and review for this podcast. Okay, so if there's really if there's one thing that you can do for me before you jump into the coding stuff to help me out and it would help me out so much is to go to coderscampus.com slash review. So what you what you can do is I'm actually running a contest right now just to sort of help you out and, and to give you a little bit of uh, incentive to go and, and, and do this with me. Uh, it, it's like I said, to go to coderscampus.com forward slash review, leave a rating and review. It can be honest. It doesn't have to be a five star. I'd obviously love it if it was a five star review. But what happens is the more five star reviews that are that are, you know, inputted into um, this, you know, uh, database of reviews for my show, um, the more people that, you know, iTunes will promote this podcast to. And the more people that it's promoted to and that listen to it, the more likelihood I have of actually creating more and more and more of these episodes on a regular, timely, you know, weekly or, or whatever the, the you know, the uh, interval is, hopefully weekly um, schedule, right? I can get these out on a predictable schedule, you know, every Thursday or every Friday or every Monday, whatever the case may be. Um, it helps me to get those episodes out because I know there's an audience waiting to hear the episodes. Just like my How to Program a Java podcast, it ended up being huge. It was, it had so many listeners. And, uh, and then I was, you know, heartbroken when it was taken off the iTunes, uh, repository. So now I had to start from scratch, which is tough, but hey, I'm willing to do it for you guys. I'm willing to put in the effort. I'm willing to win you over. So please do go over to coderscampus.com forward slash review to review this show. Now, if you do do that, Take a, a snapshot of your rating and review. I'd recommend doing it before you submit it, but because once you submit it, I think it, dis, it disappears for, I think they need to review the review, if you will. They need to make sure that there's no foul language or anything in it. So they sort of, they, they hold off on posting it to the, to the actual show notes page or the actual show page on iTunes for like a day or something like that. Anyway. I'd recommend taking a snapshot of it. So do a print screen on it or use your Snagit app or whatever it is that you use to take a screenshot. Um, grab that, that screen of the review and email it to me. Okay, so that'll be your entry into a contest that I am running. Um, we're actually going to be giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. Okay. Um, and I, I know I have an international audience, so, um, I, I'm going to try my best to be able to, whoever wins, whatever country you're in, I'm going to, you know, purchase a hundred dollar, uh, or whatever the equivalent currency is, uh, gift card for you, uh, for your own country. That's the, that's the length I'm willing to go to, to win you guys over, to, to get you to leave a rating review for the show. Um, so yeah, that is going to be the, the, the grand prize, if you will. And I might even do other prizes. I haven't really put a whole lot of thought into it, in, into what else I can give away. Maybe I can do a, a, you know, a giveaway of, um, you know, a free month or, or two of the, uh, of my coders campus membership community. In fact, that's a really good idea. So maybe as a, as a secondary prize or maybe, a you know, for second and third prize, I'll give away free memberships to, uh, coders campus, which is, um, the place where you can go to uh, get full, you know, in-depth, um, uh, courses on all the different topics that relate to web application development. So they're taught by myself, yours truly, and they're full length videos, uh, well produced and whatnot. And, um, and they teach you from, you know, zero essentially to hero, uh, takes you through all the steps you need to learn to become a full fledged, uh, full stack 
web application programmer uh, with the Java programming language and and other technologies, right? Full stack, so JavaScript, HTML, um, you know, SQL, all, all the good stuff. Uh, Hibernate, Spring, Spring Security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, it's it's a great uh, it's a great course. I'll, I'll give a couple of those away for free as well to um, the other people that I I uh, you know maybe the first, third, second, and third place winners as well. But grand prize, hundred dollar gift card to Amazon. Uh, so then you can go and and spend that. Uh, on whatever it is that you like, to your heart's content, um, it, it will be up to you. So yes, that will be up for grabs. That will be, um, let me see, that'll be eight weeks from the time that I launched this this show. Um, and I'm actually, as of right now, I'm recording the show uh, somewhere around mid-June. So hopefully, I'm hoping I can actually release this show by, let's say, July 1st. That's that's the, the, I've arbitrarily picked that date in my mind right now. I would like to launch this on July 1st, so let's see if I can stick to it. Hopefully this comes out on July 1st. If it doesn't, you can laugh at me. Um, I give you permission. So let's say eight weeks from July 1st is when I will do the drawing for the winner of this contest. So let's see, what's eight weeks after July 1st? Uh, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it'll be August 26th is when I will do the drawing for um, this uh, prize, like I said, the grand prize and the second and third place prizes. So if you leave a rating review, take a screenshot of it um, and email it to me. So right now, let's see, what's the best place you can email? Uh, for now, you can email at trevor at craftycoder.com. Uh, that's coder with no E, uh, because I'm, I'm cool like that, I guess you can say. So if, you, if ever you type in an E when you're typing in crafty coder, you've done it wrong. So just remove the E. There should only be one E. Um, and then you have my email address, trevor at craftycoder.com. Uh, email it to me with a screenshot and say, hey, I, I've done it, so please enter me into this contest, and I will put your email address into the uh, the pool of email addresses um, for the this actual draw. So like I said, even even if you just want to help me out, you don't care about the contest, um, just, you know, leave the writing review. That would be awesome. And I will stop talking about it now. So there we go. Uh, in the next episode, we're going to dive into something uh, arguably just as exciting as Spring Boot, uh, and that is Spring Data. Uh, I might even have two or three episodes on Spring Data because there's a lot of great stuff to talk about with respect to that topic. So um, stay tuned fellow coders for that beautiful episode or episodes on the topic of spring data, which is also something that's going to save you tons and tons of your precious time, um, valuable coding time. Uh, I absolutely love the stuff that spring is doing with, with the projects that they're putting out in terms of saving us time and effort and whatnot. Um, and that's, you know, you're going to learn more about that in the next episode. So I look forward to seeing you then until then Take care of yourselves. Happy learning. And bye for now. I will hand it over to my trusty, uh, beautiful female outro voice who will bring you through exactly what I already talked about, which was um, how to leave a rating review on the show. So let's tip our hat to the lady who is about to follow me, and I will see you guys next time. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Coder's Campus podcast. But before you go, Trevor has a favor to ask you. In order to keep these episodes free, he'd love for you to leave a rating and review the podcast on iTunes. Just go to coderscampus.com slash review to leave your own rating and review of the show. So if you have 30 seconds to spare right now, please help out by leaving a rating and review via coderscampus.com slash review. It will ensure that you continue to get these awesome free podcast episodes each and every week. So if you like free swag, Head on over to coderscampus.com slash review. Happy learning.